Court, Counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on May 1, 2017, the defendant was given a blessing. He was given a baby boy, a happy, healthy, innocent, helpless baby boy. Mr. McAllister said at the beginning of this case that as with all blessings, there comes responsibility. Now that you have seen and heard all of the evidence in this case, you know that the defendant didn't want the responsibility of his blessing. You know that he didn't accept the responsibility of his blessing. And you know that he let his blessing die a long and painful death. As with Sterling's death, or with his life, the defendant refuses to take any responsibility for his death as well. That's why we're here. It wasn't my job. It wasn't my problem. I didn't know. He takes no responsibility. You as the jury get to decide. You make that decision. Is he responsible? Did he know? Should he have done something? This is the time that the state has to walk through the facts with you and to walk through the law with you and to put those two things together to help you as a jury decide what's the end result. How do all of these things fit and has he committed a crime? Because you know in the beginning the judge told you this isn't a crime. It's just a tragedy. So that's another question you have to answer. Is it just a tragedy or is it a crime for the defendant's responsibility? The state has to prove to you this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We take that burden on in every case we do. We gladly take that on and prove that in every case that we have. But don't hold us to a standard that's higher than what it should be. You heard the instructions and you now know that if after a full and fair consideration of all of the evidence you are firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, then you have no reasonable doubt that you should find the defendant guilty. That's the standard. Firmly convinced. It doesn't mean beyond all doubt. It doesn't mean beyond any doubt. It doesn't mean beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's what's reasonable. Anything's possible, but that doesn't make it reasonable. We talked about that in jury selection. Anybody can throw out some alternative theory to explain why something happened or why they're not responsible, but is it reasonable? So just because it's possible doesn't make it reasonable. A reasonable doubt is based on common sense and reason. It's just that simple. It's the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act. Now that's part of the definition of reasonable doubt. Keep in mind, though, that hesitation does not mean deliberation. You heard a jury instruction at the very end of those instructions talking about how it's your duty to talk to each other, to walk through all of this, to make decisions together in this case. That's called deliberation. Some people sometimes get the misunderstanding that, well, if I don't have the answer and I have to talk about it and I have to think about it and I have to maybe change my mind here and there, well, that means I'm hesitating. That's not what it means. That means that you are being reasonable, that you're listening to other people's opinions, that you're doing your job as a juror. So hesitation does not mean deliberation. It's when you get to that final end, when you're ready to say guilty or not guilty, that's when you start thinking about, am I not sure about this? Am I hesitating? A reasonable doubt is one that fairly and naturally arises from the evidence or lack of evidence. It's based on reason and common sense and not the mere possibility of innocence. That's in the instructions. 
You're truth seekers. You are not doubt seekers. You see that in your instructions as well. It is what you need to make to see the truth. So you don't walk into a case looking for the doubt, trying to find it in any corner that you can. You walk into it, you look at the evidence as a whole, you talk about it, and if nothing is fairly and naturally arising from that, that provides doubt to you, then there is no doubt. We have two counts in this case. Count one, child endangerment causing death. Okay? Each of those are separate counts. Each of those have to be considered different from each other. Now, you're going to find out when we walk through these that most of the same facts supporting the murder first are a lot of the same facts that you're going to be using to support the count two, and that's fine. But you still have to look at each count separately. You also do not have to agree on the facts. Uh, the only thing that you have to agree on is the verdict. So, if you go back to the jury room and you need to decide whether a particular act occurred, and one of you says, well, I think it's this act that happened, and another of you says, well, I think it's this different act that happened, that's perfectly fine as long as the end result is the same. As long as if you have different facts that you believe more than another, uh, as long as the end result of guilty is the same, it doesn't matter that you're disagreeing. When you consider the evidence, you use your observations, your common sense, and your experience. You know, we talk in jury selection, you don't leave your common sense at the door when you come into a courtroom when you sit on the jury. You get to use all of those things uh, when you're deciding what evidence you believe, what evidence you find credible, who you find credible. Now, you have to try to reconcile any conflicts in the evidence, but if you can't reconcile those things, you accept what you find most believable. Okay, the defendant said he didn't know that Sterling was ill, that Sterling needed help. The evidence shows you that he did. You have to make a decision between those two conflicting things and decide which one of those you ought to find more reasonable. Lesser included offenses. Each count has a couple charges or so below it. Okay. The only way that you get to those lesser included offenses is if you find not guilty on the top. So you always stop, start with your highest charge, count one, murder first degree. You go through those elements and you make a decision. Guilty, not guilty. If you find guilty, you're done. You don't go read through the next ones and say, well, what if it is this? Maybe this was wrong. Now, if you have some questions, if you're not sure, then obviously, look at the lesson you But if you get to count one and say, yep, guilty, don't go, don't go on to the next one. So here we have our elements for murder in the first degree. During the time frame, August 4, 2017, through and including the 30th of 2017, the defendant killed Sterling. That time frame is the same time frame you're going to have on count two as well. That time frame comes from the fact of when Sterling was last seen alive by someone other than the defendant, Cheyenne Harris, to the day that he was found by the EMT. So we know the last person that we know of to see Sterling alive and to be halfway healthy at the time was Brandy Harris. That Wopsy day, she had him that whole Saturday. Said he looked a little thin, but he seemed okay. We know after that day, during that time frame, Sterling had a massive decline in his health. And something horribly long was going on at that house. You don't have to pick which day during that time frame. You don't have to, to decide if it was the entire time frame, if it was just the last few weeks, it doesn't matter. So that's where we have that particular time frame. So first element, he killed Sterling. 
Second element, Sterling was under the age of 14. Third, he acted with malice before the law. Fourth, he was committing the offense of child endangerment. And fifth, his death occurred under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to human life. Now, I'm going to hop around a little bit on these elements because it's just easier to do it that way, and you'll see why in the end. But let's do the easiest one first. Okay? Sterling's birthday is May 1st, 2017. On August 30th, 2017, he was three months old. Almost four. He almost made it to four. Okay, so there's no question on element number two. Nobody disputes it. That is proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. And keep in mind when, when I say that, it's the elements of the case that have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. And that's it. So for each element, did we prove it to you beyond a reasonable doubt? No question on number two. I'm now going to go to, to number four, element number four. The defendant is committing the offense of child endangerment. What is child endangerment as defined in this particular case? We have to show that the defendant was a parent, that he intentionally committed a series of acts using torture or cruelty, and that the result to Sterling was bodily injury. Now, all of you know that the defendant is a parent. The parties stipulated to that. I don't know if you remember out of all of the evidence that you've heard, but at some point we stood up to the parties stipulating nobody questions he is the biological father of Sterling. Right? That's proven. This is what's a little more interesting. Now, when you think of children being harmed and parents doing something that endangers them, a lot of times we're thinking some type of assault. They, they hit them, they, they shook the baby, they threw the baby up against the wall, whatever it may be. That's clearly an act. That's easy, right? Okay, but this case is different. This case is this long-term neglect, this long-term ignoring of Sterling. So, so what are the acts? that we have in this case, because we have to show a series of intentional acts. The state submits to you that during the month of August, every time the defendant entered that apartment and chose to do something else besides care for his child was an act. Every time. And pick whichever one you would like to fit into this. It was an act. Every time he walked in and sat down on his couch and turned on his TV and watched movies with Nala or played on his iPhone. Every time he did that, he chose not to walk in that room and take care of Sterling. It was an act. It was a choice. Every time he walked to his refrigerator and opened the door and got himself a pop or made himself a sandwich, or gotten all of some treats out of the cupboard. Every time he put food in his mouth to satisfy himself, but didn't walk in that room and feed his baby, that was an act. It was a choice. He had the supplies he needed. Every time he didn't walk through that cupboard and open it up and take out that formula and mix it with the water in the sink and go feed Sterling, choice. It was an act. Instead, he chose to feed himself. Every time he went into his own bathroom, his bathroom, two steps, did that from Sterling's door with an adjoining wall to Sterling's room. Every time he walked into that bathroom and was able to use the toilet in fairly clean conditions and didn't go change the diaper of his son, who had been sitting in it for at least 10 to 14 days in his own feces. Every time he did that, it was a choice, it was an act. Every time he got in that shower and he bathed himself, while his own son was sitting in his filth in a room right beside there, that was an act. 
it was a choice. Every time he went into his bedroom, because he was tired and he wanted to sleep or take his naps, every time he went in there and turned that fan on while his son sat in that hot and sweltering room with a quilt over the window with no air circulation whatsoever, with blankets layered over the top of him, every time the defendant did that, to cool himself off. It was a choice. It was an act. He chose not to go in and help Sterling. The fan in the living room, every time he turns that on, for his own comfort. Again, it's an act. That switch in the room, the switch. That was an act that didn't involve going into his son's room and helping him. Every time he took a step in that tiny apartment where you could hear every cry that Sterling made, and he said that during the interview, oh yeah, you could hear him anywhere in that apartment. And he was loud. How long do you think Sterling cried for during this time? You know, Dr. Klein testified about the fact that over time, Sterling was going to become lethargic and not have the energy to move around much and to cry. But you know it was bad at the beginning. With no food, no water. Now the defendant wants you to believe that he wasn't home enough to know that this was going on. But he was home every day in that small apartment. And every time he took a step in that apartment and that didn't lead him to his child's room to care for his child, that was an act. It was a choice to do something else. How many times did you walk by that bedroom door? We also have to show that these acts were intentional. We know that they're intentional because he knew that Sterling wasn't being cared for. Right? He can say all he wants that he didn't know. But do you find that credible? Did you believe him when he told you that? That a day or two before Sterling was found in August 30th, that he was in that room and Sterling was holding his fingers and he was playing with him? That was not honest. He knew what was going on with Sterling. And he didn't care because he did nothing about it. He knew that Cheyenne was not doing her job. Now let's be clear about this. Define the roles in your household however you would like. It, it's perfectly fine. But keep in mind that the job. No problem. But if your spouse stops and your child becomes ill, becomes hungry, needs change, and there's no one else to do that, then it's still your job as the parent to step up and to keep your child safe and to keep your child healthy. So this excuse of it wasn't my job doesn't apply in this situation. It was his job to be a parent and to care for his child no matter what. What you know is that within a 26 day period, Sterling went from thin, what we know is probably being underfed from Dr. Klein's testimony, that malnourishment had, had been going on for longer than just the last few weeks of August, but it wasn't to the extreme until the end of August. So he maybe wasn't getting enough up until that time, which is why he was so thin, but we know in August he was doing nothing from where he had. So within that 26th report to August 30th, he went from thin to starting. You take one look at that last photo of Sterling taken on July 15th, 2017, and you compare that picture to the photo from the autopsy of Sterling's face. 
then you ask yourself, how could anybody believe that he didn't know that something was wrong with Sterling? Any person looking at Sterling would have known that something was wrong with him. Now we also have to show that these intentional acts, and keep in mind that the intentional goes towards the act. It goes towards the step that he took in his apartment that didn't lead to his baby's room. It goes towards the feeding himself instead of feeding Sterling. That's the intentional. It's not that he intended to kill Sterling. That's not part of the elements of this crime. So don't, don't confuse those two. The intentional was he intended to do, to do the act. And again, pick whichever act you'd like. We also have to show that those intentional acts were using torture and cruelty. Now, there's no legal definition for these. You just use your common sense. Okay, we all have heard the word torture and cruelty, and we have all, all have our understandings of what they mean. But here's a few suggestions. Torture. Maltreatment. Cruelty. I think this one fits very well for this particular case. The callous indifference to pain and suffering. Did you see that going on here? So what evidence supports the torture and cruelty? The photos, the testimony of the first responders, Dr. Klein and Dr. Huntington's testimony. All of those things tell you that the last weeks of Sterling's life were torturous and they were cruel. That room he was in was oppressively hot. You know that from every person that walked in there, it felt like it was 10 to 15, 15 degrees hot in there. There was no air circulation. They put a quilt over the window. Tommy Frederick called the sheriff because she could tell, she knew the minute she looked at Sterling, something's not right. The smell was so bad, Jason Russell had to hold his breath. He had to hold his breath to crouch down by Sterling to look at the evidence because it was so bad in there. Yet the defendant wants you to believe that, well, he was in that room just a day or two before. And, you know, it smelled like dirty diapers, but no big deal. He had layers of soap, blankets, and clothing on top of them. Now you think about that. Did you think when you saw that, how all that clothing was stuck in the sterling? Did you wonder what that was all about? Is it reasonable to infer that they kept stuffing things in there just to continue soaking up the urine? Why else would he have all those things stuffed in there with the layers of the blankets on top of him? Everything around him was soaked. Even the things on the floor underneath the swing was soaked because it was dripping down. Get a diaper full of sewage. Okay, that child had not been changed for at least 10 to 14 days. You know that from Dr. Huntington's testimony. He had exposed raw skin, never been treated, still rubbing up against that one diaper that he had on, having the, the feces and the urine on top of it so that he didn't do it, with the E. coli getting into his blood, into his system, making his, his bodily organs shut down. He was hungry and he was dehydrated. And think about this one. During that time frame, he was never helpful. He is a three-month-old baby. And you know from Dr. Huntington's testimony that he was never touched. The maggots and the bugs, the flies, wouldn't have been in the places that they were had he been touched or picked up or moved in any way. Babies do need food, they do need water, but they also need touch. They need care. 
and he sat in that swing by himself, all alone in a dark, hot room with no one to help him. Is that cruel? Is that torturous? It is almost beyond imagination what Sterling had to go through the last several weeks of his life, completely alone in that room. That, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen is cruelty and torture, and that occurred because the defendant chose to do nothing. We also have to show that the intentional acts of torture and cruelty resulted in bodily injury. Bodily injury means physical pain, illness, or any impairment of physical condition. We don't need to discuss this any further. So I'm just dead. Element four is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. What's the child in danger? Element one, we have to show that the defendant killed Sue. If the defendant's actions caused or directly contributed to Sterling's death, then the defendant killed Sterling. That's the definition you're given for that. Every time he entered that apartment and he chose to do something else besides care for Sterling, is an act that caused or directly contributed to Sterling's death. There were two adults in that apartment both of those adults, both of those adults had the moral and legal responsibility to care for Sterling. The defendant is not excused from this responsibility because he was too tired or because diapers make him sick or because it just wasn't his job. The defendant killed Sterling. Element one is proven to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Malice of forethought. Malice is a state of mind which leads one to intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of another out of hatred or with an evil purpose or with an unlawful purpose. Further on in the definition of malice, you'll see that it may be found from actual hatred or by a fixed and deliberate intent to do injury. It may be found from the acts and conduct of the defendant and the means used in doing the wrongful and injurious acts. And it doesn't have to exist for any particular reason. Now, that right there is not a problem in this case. Usually, that's something that we have to argue a lot about. Because when we argue when someone pulls the trigger on a gun, you know, did they have the malice of forethought right before the point? It happened so fast because they have formed the malice of forethought. We know that for the month of August, this malice of forethought was ongoing. At the minimum, we know it was there at the very end of Sterling's life. So did he intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of Sterling out of actual hatred? This is one of the options. And again, these are the, the ors and the mays. So you don't have to agree to what option of malice you're picking. You just have to agree that malice exists. Did he do it act, out of actual hatred? Well, you can infer that from the evidence. He questioned whether Sterling was his. And we know that from his own family members, that he questioned whether Sterling was his. Go back to the 911 call. When he called, one of the things he said was, my girlfriend went to, to see the son. This was in the first part of that 911 call where he supposedly just found his son dead. And in that call, he calls Sterling the son. Now what does that tell you? That shows detachment. That shows you the lack of connection that he has to Sterling. You know, I was getting ready for this case, and my husband tries to avoid hearing much of anything about 
But I think we can do but I needed to learn some things about me. And as I went through and explained some certain things and thinking about how I wanted to present it, I got done and I said, what do you think? He goes, well, the first thing that I think is you need to stop calling him the baby. And he says, the second thing is you actually call the baby it one time during that conversation. And I stood back and I thought, wow, I guess I did. Because to deal with this case, sometimes you have to stand back and distance yourself. I knew that to come in here and argue this, I could not get emotionally attached. So I always call it through and the baby. And that's what he called him when he called 911. My girlfriend went in to check on the son. He never once told his good friend Jordan that he had a son, but talked about Nala all the time. He saw Jordan almost every day. Jordan was in that apartment, supposedly a good friend of his, and he never once told him about Sterling. Jordan, Jordan didn't even know they had a baby. But he talked about Noah all the time. Sterling was interfering with his relationship with Cheyenne. He was interfering with his finances. He was interfering with his life. So I'm clear what you want when it comes to that section where they had actual hatred for Sterling. Did he intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of Sterling with an evil or unlawful purpose? Well, what else do you call what happened to Sterling? Anything but evil. How can him allowing Sterling to die an extended painful death in his own home merely because he couldn't be bothered with taking care of his own child, how can that be anything but unlawful. You can also find malice from the acts that occurred, from the conduct, from the means used in doing the wrongful and injurious acts. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is why we showed you the picture. I'm sure when those came up, you may have been angry at us for doing that, because who wants to look at that? But those photographs show the malice in this case. The nature of the injuries that he had shows the malice, the malnutrition, the dehydration, the infection from diaper rash. The mechanism of injury, the acts, the denial of critical care. And keep in mind that the victim in this case is a child. It's a three-month-old child. He couldn't care for himself. Sterling couldn't protect himself. And that's the person that he chose to commit these acts upon, a defensive state. Here's the easiest thing that you can do with malice. You are allowed you're not required to, but you're allowed to infer that malice exists if you believe the state shows that the defendant committed count to child endangerment resulting in death. The reason that you get to infer that, because if you commit that type of crime, then it's just a given that malice is there. That's what the law says. It's just infer it. You commit that type of crime, malice existed. All right, so if you find that you committed count two, found the danger, causing death, then you can just say, well, now it's existed, and it's just that simple. Element three, now it's just proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Extreme indifference. Sterling's death occurred under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to human life. There should be no question about this. And again, this is a common sense definition. You know what Sterling looked like when he was found that day and how he was left like that for how many days and weeks. You know that there was food in the cupboards that he could have been fed. You know there's a bottle in the cupboard that could have been used to feed him. There was water in the sink. There was a onesie, clean onesie, in the bedroom he could have been put in. There is a bouncy seat that looks like it's never been used sitting right beside Sterling in that bedroom. 
with the clean, folded-up blanket that could have been given to him. And instead, when actions are taken, they put air pressure in under stirring the skin because it smelled too bad. That is extreme indifference to human life. These were not acts of careless neglect. These were acts that no child should ever have to endure. What was Sterling experiencing the last weeks of his conscious life? These circumstances were extreme. They were indifferent. They were in disregard of the human life. And that's murder in the first degree. That was your first count. Count two, child endangerment resulting in death. A little bit different, but it's going to go a little quicker because a lot of it's the same facts. We have to show, element one, the defendant was the parent of Sterling. Two, or Sterling was under the age of 14. Three, the defendant willfully deprived Sterling of the necessary food, water, health care, or supervision appropriate for a child of Sterling's age. Four, the defendant was reasonably able to provide. And last, as a result, Sterling suffered substantial physical harm. I should have said second to last, because also Sterling died as a result of the substantial physical harm. Those are the elements that we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in count two. So willful deprivation. We don't need to deal with counts one, or elements one and two, because we know he's a parent, we know Sterling's under the age of 14. So those are proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Willful deprivation. Go back to the previous elements we talked about. What did Lynn Peaster say when he talked about the defendant leaving the community, being excommunicated from the faith? He said that in his faith, they call that living for self. And that's exactly what the defendant was doing. Any person looking at Sterling would know that he needed help. His claim that Sterling looked fine the last few days of his life is not credible. He testified that he didn't trust Cheyenne to feed his dog. Yet then he tells you that the only thing he did wrong in this case is trusted the wrong person to care for Sterling, for his child. Did he willfully deprive? Did he know what was going on? Absolutely. He took better care of his dog than he took care of his baby. Was he reasonably able to provide? He had plenty of food in his refrigerator. He had plenty of water in his sink. He had formula, bottles, diapers, wipes, ointment in the house. Most of that was sitting in Sterling's room. He had a $140 to $280 meth tablet a week. Didn't you find that interesting when he testified and he was questioned by Mr. McAllister about how he supposedly the last couple weeks before Sterling's death, he went to his third cousin at work and asked for $20, but that was for formula. And Mr. McAllister asked him, you know, that was actually for drugs, wasn't it? And his response was, well, I use my own money for drugs. Did that make any sense to you? So he has no problem begging, borrowing, stealing, supposedly to provide for his family. But when it comes to his drugs, that will just come out of his paycheck. He was able to get health care at work. He chose not to. He could afford the dog, but he couldn't afford his own child. He had a good job. He was making money that could have gotten by. And he chose to spend that money on drugs. He chose to spend that money on himself. He chose to spend that money on knowledge before he could spend it on Sterling. Okay, so he could reasonably provide what Sterling needed. Element four is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Five and six, where we're talking about substantial physical harm, these are the same discussion that we had for causing death in count one. Uh, we know that this is a homicide. 
means it's the death at the hands of another, and it's from the denial of critical care. What this is is the death of the hands at the hands of his own father. Right? He didn't place his hands around the sermon's neck strongly. He didn't take Sterling and shake him so hard that it tore up all the blood vessels in his brain and he couldn't survive. But what he did was let him sit in that room with no food, no water, no light, no nothing, and just kept walking by the door. The defendant's actions caused substantial physical harm. Sterling, Sterling died as a result of that harm. And that's all that number here. That's a count number two. So, did the defendant commit murder in the first degree? The defendant killed Sterling. Sterling was three months old. The defendant had an ounce of forethought. He was committing the offense of child endangerment. Sterling's death occurred under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to human life. Therefore, he was guilty of murder in the first degree. Did he commit child endangerment causing death? The defendant was the parent of, the parent of Sterling. Sterling was three months old. The defendant willfully deprived Sterling of necessary food, water, health care, or supervision. He was reasonably able to provide those things. As a result, Sterling suffered substantial physical harm, and as a result, Sterling died. Therefore, the defendant is guilty of child endangerment causing death. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that straightforward. Okay, there's really not much dispute to these facts. Really, the only dispute is whether or not you're going to hold the defendant responsible for what he did. And the city is asking that you hold him responsible for what he did and that you find him guilty on both counts. Thank you.